Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, for a time to gather with your word open, to hear from you. God, I do pray that you would be our vision, that we would have our sights set on you, what you tell us we must hold high, let us hold it high, what you set before us as a matter of priority. God, I pray that you would strengthen uh, these weak hands to cling to those priorities, God, and that you would uh, give us the courage to align all of our life beneath your authority and to pursue what you say we must. God, help me to be clear in these next several moments as we look again at your word. And God, we pray that you would uh, grant clarity to all those listening that we might uh, together as, as a church labor alongside each other and press eagerly into the kingdom. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bibles once more to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai. We began here last week. And we saw that in this brief Old Testament prophecy, the prophet Haggai had one burden, and that was to urge the people to rebuild God's temple, to rebuild God's temple. And the way I tried to capture the purpose of this book was that Haggai was calling Israel's remnant really to prioritize God's gracious presence and enduring promises over earthly comfort by rebuilding this temple. The temple embodied those things, God's gracious presence that he longed to dwell with his people as their God so that they would be his people. He would perpetually, continually forgive their sins as they approached him on his terms, offering sacrifices, making offerings, And in that way, they would experience the grace of God's presence. And we also saw last week that as God's people faithfully did this, they were looking not only to the past and what God had prescribed, but also they were looking forward to what God had promised. Forward to a seed of David reigning on David's throne, having eternal dominion, a kingdom without end. Those promises were all forthcoming. And so by rebuilding the temple, once they came back into the land, this would have been an act of faith to say we trust what you have prescribed, how forgiveness is accomplished in this temporary way through the sacrificial system, and we are trusting and by faith waiting on your coming promises. These are promises that do not go away. They endure. And so building the temple, being the way to communicate those things, was of the utmost importance. And so God specifically places Haggai, uh, as well as some other formidable leaders, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, in this same period of time to lead the nation in this endeavor. Now this book, as it captures the need to prioritize what God prioritizes, to love what he loves, and faithfully live in obedience to those priorities, that was necessary in Haggai's day, and that's also necessary in our day, which makes this particular Old Testament book short as it is, incredibly relevant to us. And so this morning, we're going to look at the first 11 verses of this prophecy. Look with me now at Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I'll read through verse 11. 
In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord, Yahweh, came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of Yahweh to be rebuilt. Then the word of Yahweh came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies waste? So now, thus says Yahweh of hosts, set your heart to consider your ways. You have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, set your heart to consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and rebuild the house of God, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified says Yahweh. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little, and you bring it home, and I blow it away. Why, declares Yahweh of hosts, because of my house which lies waste, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has restrained its dew, and the earth has restrained its produce. And I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. This morning, what we'll see is four features of Haggai's effective message. Four initial features of Haggai's effective message. This was an incredibly effective message. Maybe no prophet received such an immediate response to his prophecy, to his prophetic words, than Haggai. You see this happen in verse 12. We'll get to this next week, but just look ahead. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, listened to the voice of Yahweh their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as Yahweh their God had sent him, and the people feared Yahweh. Wow, wouldn't, wouldn't you just love that, parents? You utter a word from the Lord and immediate obedience. Wow. This is incredible, the response of God's people. And next week, we'll look at the word heeded. But this week, we need to see first the word heralded. This word is heralded from God's prophet Haggai. And the first initial feature of this effective message is, number one, it's timing. It's timing. In verse one, we get a specific time when this word came. And it's in verse one. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, don't you just love the precision of God's word? You get a specific day, month, and year that you can go back and pinpoint on the calendar. And, and we can do this. The specific day of this particular month, judged by our different calendar, would actually have been August 29th, 520 B.C. August 29th, 520 B.C. And this is one of four specific days mentioned in Haggai. So he does this in verse 1. If you just scan forward and look at verse 15, you get another formula, 24th day of that same, or of the sixth month, rather, in the second year of Darius. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, you get another formula, the 21st day of the seventh month. And then finally, in verses 10 and 18 of chapter 2, you get the same day mentioned twice, the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. So you get basically this prophet, everything we have 
catalog for us in Scripture is about 15 weeks. That's his ministry that we know of, at least. 15 weeks, a few months, and he gives us the specific days and then the activities associated with it. So for this Sunday and the next three Sundays, the sermons will actually follow each of these different days recorded and what was, what was done on those days and around that time. So this is August 29, 520 B.C., and this timing is so interesting because not only does it give us just as information when the prophecy was uttered, but it describes world history because we have here a, a king, Darius the Mede, ruling the empire at the time, specifically mentioned. But it not only describes world history, but it denotes divine patience. It denotes divine patience. Just notice, this is the second year of Darius. The second year of Darius. Do you remember who was in power when the people were sent back into the land? The decree was under King Cyrus, a king of Persia. The, the world scene has changed. And when that first decree was made by Cyrus that Yahweh had uh, appointed him to build him a house in Jerusalem, that was some 17 years prior to what we're reading here in Haggai. 17 years ago, from when Haggai prophesied, the people were sent into the land to rebuild this house. Or at least the decree was, was made that the people were sent. And then 16 years before this, so a year after the decree was made, the foundation was laid. And nothing has been done since then. No progress has been made. The house still has not been rebuilt, this house of God. And so this highlights for us the patience of God to still say to his people, that house that I sent you back to be rebuilt, it still needs to be rebuilt. And God is patiently waiting on his people to obey. This implies that obedience is always necessary. There's not an end point to when our obedience is required by God. If you've delayed obedience on something, some duty, some obligation, for even 16 years, and God has been patient with you, then don't delay any longer. Obedience is always necessary. And as long as we have breath, then it's never too late to turn to God and obey in faith. This is, this is great news for us. The second thing we need to see beyond the timing of this effective message is its transmission. Its transmission. How is this message faithfully passed on? Look again at verse 1. At this particular time, Haggai writes, the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai. Now, if you're reading, depending on what translation you're reading, it might just say came by Haggai or came through Haggai. Uh, the ESV is one of the few translations to literally consistently translate this phrase, but in the Hebrew, it's literally by the hand of, by the hand of. And then the same thing is repeated again in verse 3. Then the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai, literally by the hand. What does this mean? This, this implies a few things. One, the transmission of this word from God was written, not merely uttered, not merely spoken. It wasn't merely audible, but it was a written word. God is speaking through the pen of Haggai. It came by Haggai's hand. And as we said, don't all roads lead back to Torah? Just flip back to Exodus. We'll see when this pattern was set by Moses in Exodus 24. 
Moses, being a prophet himself, was the first prophet to begin inscripturating the oracles or the instructions, the prophetic word he received from God. He gets the Ten Commandments. He's up on the mountain, 40 days. At this point, he's going up and down the mountain, and in just a, a short while, he'll receive the instructions for the tabernacle that he gets over that 40-day period. But prior to this, God wants his people to have the corpus of the law, that those initial rules that he laid down, the Ten Commandments being the center of them. And in Exodus 24, just notice what Moses does when he initially comes back down the mountain to repeat the initial, the beginning of the giving of God's law for the people. Verse 3, Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. So he recounted what God had said. He got him, heard him rightly, comes and he just repeats it for the people. All the people answered with one voice, verse 3, and said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Notice in verse 4 what Moses does after that response. And Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Then he arose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the tribes of Israel. Jump down to verse 7. He recounted the words, verse 3. He wrote down the words, verse 4. And now verse 7 he took the book of the covenant and read it. Where in the world did he get a book? He wrote it. We just read it in verse 4. So he tells the people what God says. He writes down what God says. And then he takes that writing, that book now, and he reads what God says. And verse 7 says he did it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Just fast forward one more time to chapter 35, verse 29. And we'll see this same phrase that was repeated in Haggai here said of Moses. Exodus 35, verse 29. The sons of Israel, all the men and women, whose heart was willing to bring material for all the work which Yahweh had commanded, how? Through the hand of Moses to do. They brought a free will offering to Yahweh. So when it says through the hand, by the hand of this prophet, it means that the prophet is giving a message that he has written down. The same thing is happening here in Haggai. So the transmission of this effective message was written, it was human, and it was prophetic. All of these characteristics apply. It was a written word, but it was also a human word. Just notice again back in Haggai, it came by the hand of a man with a name, Haggai. This did not cease to be the word of the Lord because Haggai wrote it or because he preached it, or because he read it. You know, your, your friends, perhaps, that are skeptics, saying, I don't believe the Bible because man, it's tainted by man. You know, never mind they believe everything else man says. <laughs> but here, it is still the word of the Lord. It maintains, it retains its divine properties, even though it's coming by a human agent. And notice, this is by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. So it's a prophetic word. This is divine revelation given to a man to be repeated without flaw as one who holds the office of prophet. And always uh, most notable when someone holds this office of prophet, they have something to say about the future. They have something to say about the future. This is often a characteristic of prophecy. It's what distinguishes biblical prophecy from other types of sacred religious writings. God is not afraid, as we've seen in point one and now point two, 
to stake his reputation on details that can be either affirmed or denied, that can either come to pass or not. God's word attached to real human history. Go look and find out if it's so. Yep, real human king existed. And here he is uttering a word for his people by the hand of his prophet. The third thing we need to see about this effective message, this initial feature, number three, is its targets. We have the timing of the message, the transmission of the message, and now the targets of the message. Notice, again, still in verse one, Haggai is writing to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. These two key players are where this prophecy takes aim primarily. Who are these men? Zerubbabel is the governor of Judah. In the Persian Empire, they had established, uh, as they sought to maintain unity within the empire, which the Medes carried on, sort of overseers of various territories, where these governors, these rulers, these men who oversaw the various territories, Shial, uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, is one of them. He is the governor of Judah. So he's the civic leader of the time. And he is accompanied by Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, who is the high priest at this time. So that makes him the religious leader of the day. You have two leaders, one overseeing the civic government, the other overseeing the religious activities. These two men together should have been able to provide direction and guidance to the people to go and do this work. So when the work isn't getting done, here, God doesn't make a beeline for the people, but he calls the leaders to account. Here, we get a good example that leaders are responsible for their people's negligence. When the people's inglorious excuses <laughs> come to play, their hip hypocritical excuses, they're not acting in accordance with God's will. God lays the burden at the feet of the leaders. And just think about this principle. This is right for God to do. The leaders are supposed to be leading the people to accomplish God's purposes, God's will. And when it's not happening, he calls the leaders to account. So you get this prophecy. This is to these men. And we're, just think about the dynamic. We're reading this now. So at some point, this letter was handed down for all the people to read. And now, again, at Grace Bible Church in Tempe, Arizona, all the people are hearing it. And then the, the two names of the leaders are front and center. This is for them. So all of the people would have known they're not doing their job. Just think about this principle in the home for a minute. Whose responsibility is it? Because Haggai is, again, addressing the priorities, the wrong priorities of the people. Whose, responsi whose responsibility is it for the priorities of the homes to be in alignment with God's priorities. It's the husband. It's the dads. Kyle preached on this in equipping hour. If you, mentioned, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and listen. Men in the room, it is your job to make sure that your wife and your kids, if you have them, know what God says the priorities in the home should be. He has made you this. It's not an option. You don't get to decide, a la Ephesians 5, whether you are the head of your home. You can be a successful head or a failing head of your home. But you are the head of your home. And wives, you should encourage your husband in this. Not whip him in the sh into shape, but encourage him in his role. Say, hey, I am eager to follow you. 
I'm looking for your leadership. Help me understand what does God say we should be doing. And men, you should be humbly, as, as leading as an example yourself, humbly helping those under your care understand what the priorities are according to Scripture. This is good leadership. To the credit of these men, there's no indication anywhere in this book that they made excuses. Kyle talked about that as well. Like Adam, let me give you this backstory for why things are the way they are. Uh uh-uh. uh. We don't, we don't need that. And they don't give that to their credit. They take it upon themselves to lead the people in doing the work. This is good. This is humble leadership to respond to God's clear word for what they should be doing. And the same principle holds true even in pastoral ministry, right? If GBC lacks clarity on what the priorities of the church are, that's on us as elders. This, this ought to be happening regularly where all of us gather together what better time would, it, would there be to help cast vision for Grace Bible Church, what the priorities of the church must be, than when God's word is preached. Week after week, God's word is opened. And not just in main service, but three times on Sunday, all of us together have an opportunity to hear again, to hear afresh from a new passage, from a different exposition, from a different series, how we can bring our lives in alignment under God's authority. So in terms of priorities, prioritize being here on Sundays. Whenever God's word is opened and you have an opportunity to hear clearly from God, prioritize being here. Dads, have you helped your family think through carefully? I know Sundays are crazy. It's always like a madhouse getting out and getting here on time. But have you helped your family think carefully about the priority of sitting under God's word, hearing God's word preached? So we're not going to swap equipping hour for family time. There's not preaching happening at home. It's good to be here. And all of the opportunities that come with being under God's word on Sunday. Anytime we gather, we, we have an opportunity Hebrews 10 says to practice those same one another's. So it's good to be here. It's good to be together. It's good to hear God's word and to be accountable to it together. The fourth thing that we need to see from this passage, and this takes us all the way through the end of the passage, verses 2 all the way through verse 11, is the teaching of this effective message. The teaching of of this effective message. In Haggai's message, he does not skip merely or quickly to the application. This is a a good principle for teaching for uh, whenever God gives a word, that word comes with instruction. How could it not? The one who is all-wise, all-knowing, infinitely good, when he opens his mouth, he is a teacher, a teacher of good things. Let me just show you this in one other place, Second Timothy 4. Hold your place in Haggai. We'll see the same principle in Second Timothy 4, because God, ever relevant, when he speaks through Paul, his apostle, another prophet in the New Testament, Paul is instructive, and even in 2 Timothy 4, when he tells young Timothy to open God's sufficient word for the church, notice how he wants him to do it. 2 Timothy 4, this comes with a solemn charge, he says. I solemnly charge you, in the presence of God, And in the presence of Christ Jesus, it's Jesus, the one who is the judge of the living and the judge of the dead, 
and I solemnly charge you by Jesus' own appearing and by his kingdom. To do what? Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready to do this in season and out of season. This should come with reproofs, rebukes, exhortation, and with great patience and what? Teaching. Teaching. When God speaks, it's instructive, which means by implication, we should be listening. With teaching, the same thing is happening in Haggai. In verses 2 through 11 is the instruction from God's prophet. Not just spoken again, but by the hand of God's prophet. And here's what he says in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. This people says the time has not come. That is the time for the house of Yahweh to be rebuilt. In this teaching, just notice there is the presentation of evidence. He just lays out the evidence for him. When, when you're hearing from the one who is omniscient, who has all evidence available to him, nobody's getting off the hook. Notice that God quotes the people. This certainly would have been spoken at the time. And apparently it was a, enough of a saying that the people lived by it and obeyed it, believed it. Okay, it's not time. And so the house didn't get rebuilt. In this presentation of evidence, there's an assumption of duty because notice the people don't say, we don't have to rebuild the house. That's not what they say, is it? They just say, the time hasn't come yet. So they recognize the house is supposed to be rebuilt, and what they're saying is the time hasn't come. There's a couple different ways you could communicate about time. You could say, for one, you could be talking about a passage of time, like, hey, there's, there's a time coming, and it just hasn't arrived yet, sort of uh, what Jesus says about my time hasn't come, right? It's coming, I know it's coming, but... It just hasn't arrived yet. There's another way you can speak about time that doesn't speak to the passage of time, but more like an opportune moment, a moment of time, an ideal time, a right time. And that's the one that's in view here. Hey, there, there is a time somewhere, but it just hasn't gotten here yet. It's just not the right time. It's not the opportune moment to go do what God says to do. And so there's not only a, an assumption, a recognition of duty. We know that the house has to be built eventually. But here there's an excuse in this saying for their disobedience. The time just hasn't come yet. It's just not the right moment. This is a hypocritical excuse to continue in disobedience. 16 years long. The time hasn't come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. And so they're just saying the time isn't right. Well, as he teaches the people, not only does he present evidence against them because the words are right there in verse 2, but in verses 3 and 4, he just pulls the curtain back on their hypocrisy. He exposes their hypocrisy for what it is. Verse 3, then the word of Yahweh came, this is, again, by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, saying, well, is it time for you yourselves to live in your panel houses while this house is waste? So the people are virtually saying something. It's not time for the Lord's house to get rebuilt, but it is time for our houses to be rebuilt, for our houses to get paneled, completed. That, that phrase... A panel used in other contexts to describe the glory or luxury uh, 
that the original temple was outfitted with. It was paneled. Um, so this, this phrase that they're living in their paneled houses could denote that they've decked out their houses, that they're living luxuriously. I think that from what else the context says in verses 6, 9, 10, 11, it's probably just intending to capture the idea that the houses have been paneled in terms of their completion. They've been completed. They're done. They're living in well-constructed, completed buildings. And they just won't do the same for God. In verse 9, at the end of verse 9, it even says that they, they're running each man to his own house, uh, describing or capturing the zeal with which they went after completing their houses. And this is one of the ways that we just see the issue isn't that they've taken it upon themselves to build their own houses. That wasn't sin to give due attention to their own dwelling places. The issue is the priority. To be eager for your own houses and to leave God's house undone is wrong priorities. And so he's exposing in this way the people's hypocrisy. What was initially addressed in verse 1 to these civil and religious leaders here, we see that they're not the only ones indicted, but all the people. This is the attitude of everyone. It's not time yet to rebuild God's house, but it is time to rebuild ours. And they're living in their own. That term in verse 4 that God uses, while this house lies waste, or literally is waste, that's the same word used in other passages that describe the entire city of Jerusalem when it was ransacked by Babylon. So the idea here is what happened to the temple and the rest of the city of Jerusalem, what, what was a good way of describing what happened to Jerusalem, that it was laid waste, it was destroyed. The same thing now, many years later, holds true of the temple. It's still in the same condition. Yeah, they've laid the foundation, but the house still isn't there. And so this is a fitting description. They still, in God's mind, in God's estimation, have not made progress because they have not obeyed him. So in this exposure of their hypocrisy, he not only describes what they're doing, but he condemns their priority. Also notice, as he continues teaching the people by presenting the evidence, by exposing their hypocrisy, there's also a requirement of introspection in verse 5. There's a requirement of introspection. He says in verse 5, So now, thus says Yahweh of hosts, set your heart to consider your ways in, in the LSB, uh, if literally translated, set your heart upon your ways. And I like that. What to do? Set your heart upon your ways. This is the, the first imperative, the first command. Set your heart. And then again in verse 7, set your heart. You know, this, this should just remove any assumption that what the God of the Bible requires of his people is just, adherence to a list of rules, obedience to a set of external regulations and rules and laws. The Bible is full of things to do, rules, laws. At times even being called the law. But it's not because God just desires rote, mechanical obedience. He says to do something with the inner person, the inner man. Set your heart. He's calling here for a fixation of the inner life on the pattern of life. 
of, to take your inner self, this is your heart, where your thoughts, desires, motivations, convictions, beliefs, all of those things tied up in the heart, the real you, the soul, the immaterial self that nobody can see, has no weight, doesn't appeal to the senses, but directs the life. Take that and give real consideration to how you've been living. Set your heart upon your ways. And when repentance happens, whenever genuine repentance happens, it always must begin here to take inventory. Do you do this, Christian? Do you practice taking inventory of your own life? Do you put this on the calendar? Do you make this a priority? Daily, I have to give thought to my ways from the heart. It's on my calendar. I've carved out time for it so that the tyranny of the urgent doesn't govern my entire life. But I say no to good things, to undertake the better thing, of shepherding my heart, of telling my heart, telling my soul what God's truth requires of me, and then everything else about my life that must flow out of that has to get in line. Do you take time to do that? This is what Haggai is calling for his people to do, for God's people to do. Set your heart upon your ways. And I didn't mention this in verse 2, but just notice how God addresses the people. Not my people, but this people. He is very displeased, isn't he? This people, is the idea, needs to set their heart on their ways. And to do that, to help them do that, he gives them several categories to think in. And I've got six to list for their introspection. Here's what he encourages them to consider. First off, as we've already seen, their inner life, because he tells them to set their heart, but not only their inner life, but their outward activity. If I'm going to be introspective and, and consider, if I'm Israel, if I'm the remnant at this time, what do I need to do? Well, I need to consider my inner life and my outward activity That's what's wrapped up in the command to set your heart on your ways, verses 5 and verse 7. But then he also gives them worth considering their own failed pursuits. Their own failed pursuits. Look at verse 6. You have sown much, but bring in little. And I think that functions as sort of a heading over everything else he mentions. They've sown much and brought in little. And so what has happened as a result of not bringing in very much of what you've sown? Well, you eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not even enough to get drunk. You put on clothing or clothe yourselves, but no one's warm enough. People are earning, but what they do earn, they put into a bag with holes. Wow, talk about being frustrated, and things didn't have to be this way. You remember what we read in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. Things didn't have to be this way. They could have been blessed in the city and blessed in the field, blessed in their going out, blessed in their coming in. Their cattle and children wouldn't have miscarried. I mean, abundant blessing was waiting if they only would have kept the word of the Lord. But now things are hard. Their failed pursuits, he just puts right into focus and he calls them to take note. They don't have enough to eat. They don't have enough to drink. They don't have, their clothing won't function rightly for them and not enough clothing to stay warm or the clothing they do have doesn't warm them. And somehow money goes missing. 
I put it right there. Can't find it. Not available when they need it. And you might be thinking, man, that's a, that's a pretty hard life. You know, never having enough, never being satisfied. We don't really know what it's like here in America to not have enough to eat. You know, my children say, Dad, I'm starving. No, you're not. You don't know what starving is. <laughs> but this gives us some sort of picture of that happening. But just note that the, the hardship of life was not an excuse for their disobedience. It wasn't like, don't you know, God, we're, we're struggling? We don't have time to build the temple? No, this is still required. And in, in truth, if you would be building the temple, your life wouldn't be as hard. As we'll see, God promises in pretty short order to bless them and be with them. So the blessings of obedience a trouble-free life, the blessings of obedience belong to those who obey God from the heart. Let me just encourage you if, you, if you are just finding that your life is just frustrated, unable to experience success, constant trouble, always, sometimes that's just divine providence and God just has to take us through trials. We get that. But sometimes, sometimes, like Haggai's people in this day, your life and the difficulty of your life is your fault. And at times, it's time to just take inventory. Is, my, is the difficulty of my life, can't have unity in my marriage, can't gain traction with my children, losing friends, constant turmoil, conflict, trouble. Sometimes that's just because we're not operating by God's wisdom. And so setting our heart to consider our ways is a good course of action. Notice also in verse 8, he puts their obvious duty before them. What else to consider? Your obvious duty. So simple. So simple. Go up, verse 8, to the mountains, bring wood, rebuild the house of God. That's it. Do what you know you should have done. And, and look, that does not sound easy to me. Climb a mountain, fell trees, bring them back down. It sounds like Billy Al. Smith's laughing, yeah. Uh, in 2015, a small army of us from this church and partnering churches flew to Papua New Guinea three-week trip, and we did this. We built houses. <laughs> we built houses. We had to transfer tons of lumber across the sea, <laughs> have them taken out of the boat onto dinghies, pulled on the shore, take those same pieces of wood, carry them again onto the beach, and then from the beach many, many yards across into an open field to be, again, arranged into piles, brought by helicopter into the tribe. And then we carried those same pieces of wood <laughs> to the houses and constructed houses. I mean, this is not easy work. The command's simple. The command's clear. Go do the hard work of rebuilding the house. So disobedience, or obedience, you can say, even when it's simple and clear, is still hard work. And the people are being called to undertake the hard work of rebuilding the house. It would be worth it. It will be worth it. Even when they rebuild this house that lacks even a sliver of the glory that it had when Solomon built it, God honors their obedience and abundantly blesses them beyond their efforts. And that in itself is a lesson all its own. We'll get there. But if obedience today seems to you like too tall a task, just consider that God will bless you far beyond your obedience, far beyond your efforts. So take heart. 
Obey the Lord in the small things. And even your meager efforts, as imperfect and inglorious as they may be, they will still yield blessing beyond what you've earned. This is what God is calling them to, this kind of obvious duty. Just notice the reasons behind this. He doesn't uh, call them to undertake this, verse 8, so that they would be pleased or so that they would be glorified. But this is for his acceptance, so that I may be pleased and be glorified. Um, He would accept the work. He would be pleased with it. And he would be glorified by it. So he would even ensure that he received the glory from their efforts. This is a pattern for obedience. Whenever we strive with God's glory in mind to obey him, he makes sure that he gets all the glory. It's for his pleasure, for his glory. We've got to train our hearts, don't we, to be motivated by this? It's not about your own comfort. We could say, okay, if I obey God, my life's going to be made much easier. And yes, that's oftentimes true. But that can't be the foundational motivation. The foundational motivation has to be God's pleasure and God's glory. That is a worthy pursuit. Also, he calls them to consider their frustrated desires. This is verse 9. Their frustrated desires. You look for much, but behold, it comes too little, and you bring it home, and I blow it away. Why? Because of my house which lies waste, while each of you runs to his own house. You think it's a small thing to have wrongly ordered priorities? It's not. Not to the Lord. It is not a small thing to him to live disordered lives or wrongly prioritized lives. God here reveals that he has set himself against his people because they won't get their priorities where they ought to be. So again, looking for much, and then behold, and look, it comes to little. So they're looking for abundance, and God ensures that they don't get it. He is just frustrating their their efforts here. What they do bring home, he blows it away. Clears it out. They just can't maintain what they really want. And isn't that a kindness of the Lord, though? Your wrong desires, I love you too much to let you have them. You cannot get the abundance that you pursue. You cannot keep the things that you really cherish. Prioritize me, he's telling them. That is a kindness from the Lord. When God doesn't give us our way, doesn't give us everything we want, that is from a God who knows how to love us better than we know how to love ourselves. So not only frustrated desires, but lastly, just notice in verses 10 and 11, their subjected environment, their subjected environment. Therefore, and again, he gives them the blame because of you, the sky has restrained its dew and the earth has restrained its produce. Wait a minute, wasn't God the one doing this? Wasn't he the one blowing it away? And the idea is yes, He is set against them because of what they've done. So the sky won't even give due. The earth won't even produce. And this isn't the entire earth. The idea is the land. The same word there in verse 10 being the word in verse 11 for land. I called for a drought on the land. So the sky won't give due on this land, the territory of Israel that they're now inhabiting. He's restrained the produce of this portion of Israel's land. And he's called for a drought in that same place, in the land. Not only in the land, but 
on the mountains this is the case. He's called for a drought, as it were, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground brings forth, literally on the man, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. How would you like for God to oppose you at every point? On all the labor of your hands. I mean, you read this passage, and there's a lot of activity. They're building their own houses. They are sowing much. They're eating, drinking, clothing themselves. They're seeking their earnings. They're looking for much, according to verse 9. They're bringing what they can home. Lots of activity. And yet not much to show for it. My mom used to say all the time, lazy people work the hardest. You know, every time we threw some trash across the room because we didn't want to walk over to the garbage can, miss. And we got to get up, <laughs> go get it. You know, the, the people in Haggai's day, are, they are lazy. They are apathetic. And lots of commentators capture that theme. But their apathy, their laziness, isn't across the entirety of life. They're busy at lots of things, just not the most important things. And so what ends up happening is that they do work harder. And they have little to show for it. These are all, as we've said, an outflow of divine judgment. Again, you can read Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 for a list of those curses that will come upon them if they did not obey the Lord. This is what's happening all in their day. And so this is a subjected environment. Creation just won't work right. And you can write down Romans 8.20, because in Romans 8.20 it says that God is the one who has subjected creation. Creation has been subjected to futility because of him who subjected it. And Israel is getting that in highlighted fashion as God uniquely subjects creation, causes it to not work right. I blew it away, he said in verse 9, verse 11, I called for a drought on the land. God is personally opposed to Israel for not prioritizing what he said they must. And likewise, if we don't, prioritize what God says we must, he will likewise oppose us. As we close, I want to just draw your attention one more time to verse 6. Notice uh, we said that this, this was effective. This was an effective message, an effective rebuke because of what follows. The people actually turn, okay? So God's strong rebuke that we've been reading in these first 11 verses are a kindness from the Lord. Even when they come through a human medium, this strong rebuke is a kindness from the Lord. So when somebody comes to you with a strong rebuke, a strong concern, and just puts their finger in a tender spot in your life, receive it as a kindness from the Lord. It's good. It can prove effective in our lives causing us to believe God, please him, and then receive the blessings of turning in obedience. But let me just show you in verse 6, this theme here appears elsewhere in Scripture. Again, the you've sown much but brought in little, I think functions as sort of an umbrella. And then notice what flows out as they've tried to get much and brought in little, what are their activities? Eating, drinking, clothing. Or you could say they've prioritized food, drink, clothing. Food, drink, clothing. Does that sound familiar? Good, I see some some heads nodding. Look at Matthew 6. Jesus picks up on these same categories, these same pursuits, and he tells us what to do with them. 
Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. And this is on the heels of a warning to not store up treasures on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven. So what does he go on and say? Verse 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So those same categories in verse 25, what you eat, drink, clothing. It's the same. In Haggai's day, they needed to hear to put off earthly comforts, don't prioritize earthly comforts, and rather prioritize what God says you must, his gracious presence, his enduring promises. The, that gracious presence for God to dwell among his people, those enduring promises, this is where Haggai is going. It all culminates in a coming kingdom. This is where this goes, a kingdom that cannot be removed, cannot be shaken, just like the promises, the kingdom endures. What does Jesus say to now his New Testament audience? This same conversations about not prioritizing, not being overly consumed with or worrying about food, drink, and clothing. Look at verse 34, or rather verse 33. What should they seek if not seek these things? Seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry, again, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Message in Haggai's day, prioritize what the kingdom demands. Message in Jesus' day, prioritize what the kingdom demands. The kingdom that's coming and the righteousness that characterizes the citizens who get in. Prioritize obedience. Do you believe that an enduring kingdom is coming? Then don't waste your life prioritizing earthly comforts. That message was relevant in Haggai's day. The same message was relevant in Jesus' day. The same message is relevant for us. Seek the kingdom. Seek God's righteousness. God will take care of the rest. Let's pray. God, thank you for such comfort, such comforting words, even uh, the, the comfort that can come from a clear rebuke, a clear warning against such priorities. You are such a gracious God who has compassion to warn us against things that would be harmful to us, that would be suicidal to the soul. Help all of those hearing this message this morning to be those kinds of people who would seek first your kingdom, your righteousness, who would prioritize obedience and walk in a fear of you such that we might confidently lay hold of the unshakable kingdom that is coming. And we pray all this in the name of the King, Jesus. Amen.